everybody ready for the mind of the magnificent show? And welcome, my friends, to yet another episode of the Mind Dog TV podcast. I'm Matt Napo. Thanks for coming. It's great to have you here. As always, we have a super interesting show for you today. No lie. No lie. I wouldn't exaggerate. Uh, <laughs> let me talk about my sponsors quickly before I introduce my guest. And uh, you're going to be really fascinated with this uh, story we're about to present to you today. So hang in there. Let me just run through these uh, sponsors pretty quickly, and then we'll get right to the big program. Today's show is sponsored by Audiobooks Now, audiobooksnow.com. Um you know about the convenience of audiobooks. Everybody does. I mean, just the fact that you can take them with you in your car and listen listen to a book while you drive or uh, while you go about doing menial chores around the house or whatever. It's very convenient. You know about that. So why audiobooksnow.com? You can get them just about anywhere. You can get audiobooks almost anywhere online these days. Why audiobooksnow.com? Well, it's simple. It's price point, price point, price point. Audiobooks Now Club pricing plan is simply the best deal on audiobooks you'll find. It offers the savings and flexibility not found anywhere else uh, with their save on everything discounts, rollovers, exclusive offers, loyalty program, incredible selection, and cancel anytime policy. Simply can't be beat. Plus, you get a, a Free premium audiobook on select titles. Start your 30 day free trial by clicking on the link that's in the description, uh, and it, you'll get 30 days absolutely free. You can cancel if you're not happy to uh, cancel before the 30 days is up, and you won't be charged a cent. Great deal. So try it out now, audiobooksnow.com. Today's program is also sponsored by FunWise Capital. FunWise Capital is a business lender matching platform that gets you the best lines of credit guaranteed. You can apply online in 60 seconds or less, and there's no effect to your credit to see how much you can get. Use the funding for anything you need to start or grow your business. I said start, yes. Get the funding, best funding you can qualify for. The strategic lender matching platform searches through hundreds of lenders to find the very best possible option for your unique situation. They have hundreds of five-star reviews on Google, Trustpilot, and Facebook, and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. They, they provide unsecured lines of credit at 0% interest for 9 to 15 months. You're not going to beat 0% anywhere, folks. Unsecured term loans loans based on income, short-term gap funding, and bridge loans. Uh, they work with real estate startups, like I mentioned, franchises, restaurants, any kind of business, any kind of project. To get started, it's really simple. You just go to apply.funwise.com slash minddog, apply.funwise.com slash minddog. The links are in the description, and I do appreciate you uh, patronizing our sponsors. Now on to the big time uh, program. You know, uh, doing 350 episodes of this program now, I've gotten to talk to a lot of interesting people with a lot of interesting stories. But if you follow the program, you know, at, in the back of my mind, it's always, well, that's cute. You think you got a story. You can't match my story. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, I have led a pretty wacky life myself. Uh, but I almost always think that, you know, the guest has an interesting story, but they're not going to top my crazy story. Uh, I think I might be wrong today. I think I might be wrong today. I think my guest today might have a uh, crazier story, crazier, have led a more interesting and crazier life than I have. Uh, Lisa Cohen is the author of the best-selling book, To the Moon and Back. Uh, the best seats Lisa ever had at Madison Square Garden were at her mother's mass wedding. <laughs> and, and the best cocaine she ever had was from her father's friend, the judge. Uh, born to, to hippie parents and raised in New York City's East Village in the 1970s, Lisa's early years were a mixture of encounter groups, primal screams, macrobiotic diets, communes, Indian ashrams, Jefferson Airplane concerts in Central Park, and watching naked actors on off-Broadway stages uh, during the musical hair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's not waste any time here. Please open your ears, open your minds, and help me welcome in Lisa Cohen to the Mind Dog TV podcast. Lisa, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. You made me laugh. <laughs> and that's my description. Yes. <laughs> well, um, I, I've had a lot of interesting people on the program. Um, that intro 
tops them all so far. Uh, <laughs> so where do where do we even begin with your story? For, <laughs> I mean, uh, it, I guess we start right at the beginning. But um, how <laughs> how young were you when you realized you were uh, not experiencing the uh, typical Leave It to Beaver American <laughs> upbringing? Well, that question probably has multiple answers, at least two, because on one hand, I knew very young because my parents, even before the cult, before the Unification Church, my parents were crazy. They were hippies. It was a lot of insanity and primal screams and encounter groups and all of that. And I just wanted Leave It to Beaver. I really, 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 that's all I wanted. Um, and on the other hand, it wasn't until I was 24, 24 years old, you know, much further along, have left the church, you know, have done a lot of destructive things. I'm engaged to an alcoholic, about to get married. And I stumble into, or someone directs me to Al-Anon, that 12 step program for those of us with our hands around the alcoholic, our arms around the alcoholic. And I tell my story and people's jaws drop and I go, oh, <laughs> Oh, I guess it's not just weird. <laughs> it's like really weird. So, so at a very young age, and then like when it's all you know, it's all you know. It wasn't until I was much older that I was like, wow, I guess it's, you know, yeah, I guess it's something. Right. When, when I tell people some of the stories from my life, I, I get a, a, a reaction. I'm guessing you probably get a lot. Did you just make that up? <laughs> well, I, I can tell you that there's some possibility that this may become some sort of scripted, you know, TV thing. Right. And uh, the person I'm talking to said, well, we need to think about the tone because if we make it too serious, no one will believe it actually happened. I'm like, <laughs> but, it, but it did, <laughs> but it's me. Yeah. So I, I can relate to that. But uh, so uh, I don't think uh, you I think the story, I mean, as it's, it stands, would hold a lot of interest for people. And I do think they would believe it in these times because, uh, you know, the world is getting crazier and crazier every day. Uh, and so uh, even though the idea of growing up in like a cult on one hand with, with your mom side and um, just like, I guess what could best be described as hippie squalor drug nest uh, on the father's side might seem like uh, to me because it seems like pretty extreme. But I think in today's world, it probably would be accepted as, oh, yeah, that happens. Oh, yeah, that happens. <laughs> you know, I, yes. And so on one hand, the story is unique because we had both of these, me and my older brother. And I like to say only only my older brother and I really have the same kind of story that I've seen so far. Most people have one or the other. And on the other hand, yes, and, and whereas the story is unique, the themes are universal because everybody has something, right? Which is why I wrote the book and I'm out here because so many of us are walking around with the shame and horror of things that aren't ours to have shame about. So, so I, again, I think both are true. It is, it is kind of unique. I'm still looking for that person who had to go back and forth between these two crazy existences. And <laughs> what I do get when people say, you know, the best cocaine I ever had was from my father's friend, the judge. I've had people say, well, not really a judge, right? And I'm like, no, yeah, actually a judge. And I've also done a reading with my high school boyfriend in the audience. And from the back, you hear, that was really good cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you don't, you, That that's a very good point. I mo Most people who have a, a really interesting story. It's it's really in one direction, but you were kind of torn in two directions, which are both extremely, uh, just just extreme is enough of a, a word to describe it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I need to, first of all, I'm, are your parents still alive or, or have they passed or? They are both still alive, absolutely. Do you have a good relationship with, with either of them or both of them? I... I definitely have relationships with them. I, I, it would be, I would say it is good for what, for what we've been through and where we are. Uh, my dad, my dad, unfortunately, I'm trying to do this like uh, 13 years ago at the age of 64, still was doing too much cocaine and had a stroke um, and paralyzed half of his body and his wasn't an assisted living facility, except he kept smoking in the room and lighting too many fires that they had to move him into. He still can't make it up. I had to move into a nursing home. Um, and I'm his primary caregiver. Um, I have not seen him since March because of COVID, but he's 15 minutes away from me. And 
Danny, so I call my father Danny to this day. You know, my father has always said, I'm a person, I'm not a label. Call me by my name. If you call me dad, I'll call you dad. If you call me father, I'll call you daughter. Call me Danny. So Danny is 15 minutes away and I, you know, take care of him and I love him and I keep him at a distance, you know, because he is crusty and mean and a lot of not nice words and has a lot of love but can't show it. But so, yes. And then on my mom, my mom, so if I left the church somewhere between 81 and 85 or something, it was a slow process. My mom left in 96 when my oldest child was born. And over the years, we have kind of gone you know, back and forth and back and forth close in a way because she just still used to do things and say things that you would never say or do to a kid, to your kid, I think. Um, and But we are building a relationship. It's good. It's got a lot of you know, um, potholes. Right. And but, you know, both my parents are better grandparents than they were parents. And I am blessed with compassion and love for them usually. So, again, keep at a distance. Keep safe. I've had to learn to do that. But, yes, you know, we'll hopefully come down for some sort of holiday celebration with my kids. And, yes, in my life. Okay. Yeah, I I, um, I can see where you're coming from with compassion. and You know, forgiveness and understanding that everybody is carrying some kind of burden and, and people make mistakes. We're all human and people make decisions that can lead to bad, you know, bad lives or, you know, bad instances. So I, I appreciate your forgiveness and I'm, I'm of the same kind of uh, thought process, but it, it's just curious. Uh, um, do you ever, uh, or have you ever had that moment of saying, like to your father, Dad, how did this happen? Oh, Danny, <laughs> how did this happen to? You? How did you? What led you down the path that that brought you to like the slums of New York City and and that whole drug infested lifestyle? Did you have you ever kind of had that moment of discovery with him? Um, not with him as much. Um, one because he had a stroke thirteen years ago. Two because I remember many years ago, actually, I was pregnant with my first child, and he came up to visit me. And, you know, which is wonderful. And we're going for a walk. And I said, you know, I, I'm really worried about your drinking. And he said, thank you. That's very nice of you. <laughs> so he truly, as I like to say about my parents, what does it mean when both your parents apologize for leaving you with the other one? My father truly <laughs> believes that the worst thing he did to us was leave us with my mom. When he, right. I and so he, he, he's, he doesn't, he doesn't circle around like hat making, letting my brother smoke pot at the age of 10 or offering to sell me to his friends for drugs or just, you know, the, yeah. I like to say the rules we had with him, he used to say, don't, so we grew up in New York city on second Avenue. He would say, don't shoot up smack on second Avenue because you may pass out. If you're going to shoot up smack, come upstairs. If it's oh me, that's fine because you'll be awake, but smack you'll pass out. So definitely come upstairs. And I have come to believe that he did all of this with like, I'm going to give my kids an open existence, maybe actually to balance the puritanical restrictive cult we were raised in. So I, I think he thinks he did all of this with our best interests in mind, even though I would not do any of the things he did. Right. But we haven't, someone asked me that recently, like why, why, you know, my mom, I can understand a lot of stuff. I know why my dad is crusty. I know why he can't show love. I know how he was treated as a kid. I don't know why he's just alternative. He um, likes to argue and disagree and live an alternative lifestyle. You know, the, the good part of my alternativeness, whatever came from. I, my dad. I yeah. can relate. I can relate. He, th he didn't see much wrong with the life that he was living. And yeah. so, and so he wanted to make sure that if you got involved in things that you at least had some precautions, like not not shooting up smack on the street, or but open that. Uh, you know, I I grew up with a a much toned down version of that, where people would re prefer their kids to drink in the house or smoke pot in the house rather than be out on the street. Uh, not necessarily uh, <laughs> shooting up smack or what, whatever, uh, but I can I can understand the mindset that he had. I'd rather she do it be, and be safe than yeah. if she's going to do it. Um, now you said you got out of the church in eighty in the early eighties. You were in the church. Were you? Were you a? Uh, did did you prescribe or subscribe to the uh, the all the ideas and ideology of the church? He was my Messiah. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely. It was my life. It was my belief structure. It was everything I cared about. It was truth. I like to say there's no, nothing as intoxicating as having the truth with a capital T, right? And it was truth and he was my Messiah. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Every single part of it. Never good enough to, didn't deserve there to be there. I bought into the whole thing. Um, can you tell, can you share with us how, was what was it instantaneous? I know uh, you grew up in it, and your mom, but uh, you weren't born into it, right? You didn't start right. From, when did when did it start? And, and can yeah. you kind of give it some insight and in how that happens is like an instant type of thing. <laughs> yeah, so it's different for those of us who are children or born, right? And then people who actually join are called first generations, where I'm a second generation. But my story is, so my parents, you know, met when they were in high school got pregnant with my brother, got married at the age of 18, had him at 19, had me at 20. Soon thereafter, we're separated and we were living with my mom in East Orange, New Jersey. And my dad is traveling the world and in New York City. And it's the whole hippie, squalor, drugs, abusive boyfriends, insanity. And the summer between my second and third grade, my mom bought a van for my dad from Danny because we were going to drive across country to California to live on a commune. Instead, my grandmother, my mom's mom got diagnosed with cancer. So we drove across New Jersey to move into my grandparents' house and we stayed and my mom, my grandmother passed and my mom stayed and took care of my grandfather and ran the household. And then in uh, January of 1974, my mom's friend with whom she used to hitchhike across country every summer called her and said, you have to go hear Reverend Moon speak. And my mom went to hear Moon speak in Princeton, New Jersey in January and came home. <gasps> You know, like this new person, like, oh, my God, it's amazing. Jesus wasn't supposed to die. There's hope. There's a way. My mom has always been searching for truth. And, you know, she did every religion and every she did them all for a while. And so she came home really excited. Not a lot happened. And then towards the summer, the Moonies, you know, other members convinced my mom to go up to Barrytown, New York, where they had a huge building, a huge old seminary where they would indoctrinate people. And she went up for the weekend and came back home and went up for a week and came back and went up for another week and came back and basically just spent most of the summer in Barrytown. And then one weekend, put Robbie and me in the van and drove us up. And, uh, you know, so we pull up to the building and we meet people and then we go into this huge gymnasium and all the sisters, all the women are sitting on the floor on the right side of the room and all the brothers, the men are sitting on the floor on the left side of the room. And within moments, Moon walks in with his interpreter and he starts speaking and I'm in. And people would say, well, why do you believe? And I'm like, well, first of all, if your mom tells you it's true, it's true, right? And when my dad left, my life only revolved around my mom and I needed to believe and do everything she believed and did. And if you're in a room where enough people bow to somebody and take off their shoes and treat that person like they're holy, then you know the person is holy. And so from that moment on, it was everything and we believed and I believed and my mom was happier in some ways. Right. And, and okay, go back to the duality of my life. It was structure in a lot of ways. It was a haven for my brother and I, there were people who adored us, who loved us. We got a lot of love. My mom became in some ways more structured. I mean, a lot of bad things happened that I can explain, but it it was a safety from the craziness of the life we were living. You know, uh, years ago, I read um, Anthony Kiedis says, I probably say his name wrong the lead singer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I read his memoir, Scar Tissue, and he, I got called Robbie, my brother. I'm like, you have to read this because his description of his life growing up with his dad in California was a better description of my growing up with Danny than I actually wrote. I was like, you have to read it. It's our childhood. And Robbie reads it and he calls me up and he goes, well, first, at least he had blank inconsistency because we went back and forth. Robbie says, do you think I would have been a heroin addict if we hadn't joined the church? And I'm like, Hell yeah, you're smoking pot at 10. Our only rule is don't shoot up smack on 2nd Avenue. Of course, my brother, I was like probably too goody two shoes, but Robbie would have totally, most yeah. likely, not heavily, heavily, heavily into drugs. So this cult saved us from that life. Okay. Now, uh, the, the thing that struck out in that answer was this, you were craving structure and it felt like it, it, it was, it made you feel grounded. Like you had, had some kind of life now from your perspective. And I know you can't read minds, but were most of the people in, in the cult, not necessarily um, from the same very torn duality that you had, but also craving that structure in some way. So, 
Yes and no. Um, cults don't find only broken people, right? The reality well, that's, that's is- That's the question. That's exactly right? the question I'm asking, yeah. The reality is we are all susceptible to extremist belief because as human animals, we crave certainty, purpose, and community. That's what we want. We need it. We live and die for that. Well, a cult gives you absolute certainty. It is hugely intoxicating. It is powerful. It is a drug. It gives you purpose. You don't have Monday morning blues. You know why you're here. You know exactly what you're supposed to do. And it gives you a community you will never, ever replicate. So mm. it fills a need for so many people. I, I, I like to say everyone is susceptible. I was corrected by an expert who said, unless you are uh, have psychosis, or a sociopath, or are already in another group. It's just a matter of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, meeting the wrong person, and being a little open to what they're saying at that moment. And it's and then there are actual techniques they use to indoctrinate you. Absolutely. So, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. I'll tell you. Um, I worked for what I consider a cult, although. They didn't. They didn't live in a commune, but they they were joined by this common purpose of a very out there idea, uh, at least out there in in my terms. And I worked for them and lived kind of because we were on the road a lot and stayed in hotels with them. Uh, and I've always had an open mind to the kind of things that they were talking about. I did not find myself uh, ever wanting to join it. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the kind of thing kind of scared me. Just the whole idea of being part of that kind of organization yeah. uh, scared me. So that's why I didn't uh, I didn't do it. But it's interesting, I, you know, listening to what you say, uh, there is definitely that absolute certainty that this is right and that there, you know, no questioning any of that kind of stuff. Um, but I always did come from the part that everybody's... And actually, we the crew talked about it all the time. Everybody here is broken, including us, mm -hmm. in some way, you know. And I think the world is full of broken people in my... In my yeah, we, all, we all have something that, you know, I don't think people are broken. Right. I, I like to say that, you know, when the book came out in 2018, I realized that I still thought I was damaged. Right. I have damage. I have scars. I'm not broken. There are parts of me that broke that have, like, that have cracks, right? It's a very <laughs> different perspective, but we all have something, right? I mean, right. my next door neighbor, when the book came out, they had no idea. And she called me up and she said, thank you for giving us all the courage to tell our childhood stories because everybody's walking around with something. Right. Well, I appreciate that, that new perspective you just gave me, but I just kind of think, uh, you, you, you can have a lot, a lot of cracks. You can have a lot, a lot of cracks. You can like this big. <laughs> yeah. So, so you were happy in it. What happened in the mid-80s that kind of said made you think it was time to get out? So what happened? Here's where the soap opera starts. So never lived. First of all, the church, my church did not have communes. They had centers, but it wasn't the same sort of compound thing. But so we never lived, Marabi and I never lived in a church center. We lived with Danny, but spent every weekend, every afternoon, every holiday, every summer, always in a church, whether or not my mom was around, that was my life. And the summer between junior and senior year of high school, Danny sent me to music camp to keep me away from the church because he would never spend money on, on anything for me. So he sent me to music camp and I became friends with people who for the first time knowingly to me were gay and or bisexual. And that is a huge sin in my puritanical church. So I write my mom and I'm like, I love these people. They're wonderful, but they're gay or they're bisexual. What do I do? And she writes back and she says, they're evil. They're sinful. You can either convert them or just stay away from them. And for the first time, my brain goes, that doesn't, I can't just agree with it. And you have to understand. So in a, in a cult and extremist situation, it's called the bite model. They control your behavior information, thinking, and emotions, right? And so we were literally told, if you ever questioned anything, it's Satan in your head, in your soul, trying to win you back from God. So as soon as you question anything a leader has said or your mother has said or the doctrine, you're terrified because now you know that Satan is literally living inside you. It's a yeah. problem. Like no, I get it. I, I, I'm scared already. Right? And so <laughs> the person I'm questioning and aware that Satan is now inside me because I'm questioning, and I come back from music camp, and so I'm not only a Mooney, but I happen to be best friends with Reverend Moon's children, the true children. 
right? Wow. Yeah, I'm up in there, right? And, and I'm also friends, so these have these huge mass weddings, they're called blessings, and the kids that are born from those marriages are called blessed children, and they're born without original sin. They're very special and holy. And I'm friends with the true children, Reverend Moon's children, and I'm friends with blessed children. And I come back from music camp, and one of my friends, one of the blessed children, had been seduced by our Sunday school teacher. This is the soap opera part. And she's having an affair with him and she gets pregnant. And in order to keep anyone from noticing, she spreads rumors about me. She basically tells everyone I wanna sleep with all the men, all the brothers. Moon, the Messiah, hears the rumors, believes the rumors, and it makes a decree that only blessed children can play with the true children. Basically makes a, a decree to keep me away from his kids. So I come back from music camp questioning knowing that Satan is in me that I'm, and therefore I'm questioning. And then my Messiah banishes me so that Messiah knows that I'm sinful and evil too. It's like a great, great combination. So I go to my senior year of high school and I think, okay, you followed your mother into this church as a 10 year old. You have not made an adult decision. You're now 17. You're going to pull back a little bit and make an adult decision to come back and never question again. And so I pull back a little bit. I start hanging out with Danny on the weekends instead of going to the church. I become better friends with friends at school, where I'm at school in New York City at Stuyvesant High School. And I find more love and acceptance with these friends than some of the hypocrisy in the church. And I'm tormented and I'm, it, you know, I'm very, you know, if you look at my high school yearbook, it's all like, what are you going to do, Lisa? What are you going to do, Lisa? How are you going to decide, Lisa? And, uh, then I start experimenting with alcohol and I get drunk at a party and I kiss a boy. Oh, and the other big sin is premarital sex, right? So I kiss a boy, I have a boyfriend and then all hell breaks loose. And everyone's all freaked out. You're gonna fall and you're gonna leave. And I, summer goes on and I go off to college, I go off to Cornell. And my boyfriend, Adam, stays in New York City at NYU. And I am determined that I will break up with him and go back to God and the Messiah. And I don't. <laughs> And I don't. And that begins the slow process of, you know, in a cult survivor community, we have a con uh, concept of you can be physically in or out, emotionally in or out, and mentally in or out. So that begins my physically being out, but emotionally and mentally, I still believe. So I know he's the Messiah. I am just so sinful that I can't do it. And then I, yeah, my freshman year, I almost jump off the bridge because it's Cornell. My junior year, I be my sophomore year, I become hugely anorexic. My junior year, I do a hell of a lot of cocaine with the judge. My senior year, I just start getting in more and more and more abusive relationships until I end up engaged to an alcoholic at the age of 24 and crawl into Al-Anon going, tell me if he's an alcoholic. There's no way I'd ever be with an alcoholic because I'm so fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> completely functional on the outside and completely broken on the inside. Long uh -huh. story. I, I, I could just see, you know, you just getting the question that I said before. Did you just make that up? Oh my God. What a, what a tale. Uh, I, I mean, and the, the actual, the actual moon himself. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I will tell like other, we're called second gen. So in the last few years, I met all these other adults who were kids and born and raised in the church. And when I tell them that story, they're like, wow. Moon banished you. I mean, like the Messiah kicked me out. It's like it doesn't get more good or bad than that. So yeah, yeah. Well, I can almost relate to, but not because Moon is like um, it, he was almost the Beatles of 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 Messiahs in the seventies <laughs> because there were a I lot. I use that line. That's so excellent. Yes. There, there, there were a lot of them, but he was he was one of the biggest ones and yeah. one of, and had the most devoted followers, I yeah. think. Wow. Uh, so your mother was still in it for uh, several years after a decade after that, though, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, I would think. I'm not sure about this, but the longer you've been in there, the harder it is to kind of break away. How do you know what? Did you facilitate her leaving? No. Um, so, yes, the longer you're in, the harder it is to break away because, one, you le you're leaving everything you know and love, right, and, and all that structure. And, two, our brains have this wonderful thing called cognitive dissonance, right. which only allows us to see and understand and believe things we already believe. So, I, you know, flash floor, right, when I tell my mom now horrors of the church, evils that I've learned in the recent past, She'll literally say, well, why is so-and-so still in there? And I'm like, let's talk about cognitive dissonance because the more it, it I used to, I have, in the book I wrote, it's like vines wrapping their way around your brain, right? The more it's entangled in your brain, the harder it is to break free of that. And so my mom is actually very fascinating. Um, 
1996, she's down in DC in the church, but not working for the church, but in the church. And I give birth to my first child. And my mom had told her job that, you know, I was going to give birth. And when I did, she was going to come up and help me for a week. And, and they said, okay. And she came up and helped me and she went back and they fired her. And so there's my mom in DC without a job. And she was up visiting sometime after that. And, and you know, some, I don't know what we're looking at, but I saw this thing for NYU. They had a master's in early childhood education. So you have to understand my mom has always worked with kids. In fact, she left us when, when she did leave us with my grandfather, you know, whatever, and moved into the church. She worked with the, the group that helped people who had kids and therefore couldn't move into the church. And then for years, she worked in church nurseries where the blessed babies would be left by their parents. And my mom, so my mom raised all these kids to this day. I meet people and they're like, oh, your mother took such good care of me, right? So ironically, she left us to do that. But so she's always been with kids. So I say, you should go to NYU and get your master's. And she moves up to New York and starts and gets her master's at NYU and just starts this whole new life and just pulls herself out of the church and never looks back. Pissed me off at the time, still pisses me off, um, but whatever. And then we have this whole, we've built a relationship and it is what it is. And now, so now I bring this up because now my mom, it's like she, for many years she could not, she would literally call us up and say things like, oh, I talked to so-and-so, this kid that I took care of, and they're so traumatized because their parents left them when they were little. And my brother Robbie and I would be like, yeah, they are. Like she could not, she would say, I wish you would get over how upset you are that I left. And only in the recent past has she come to see that, you know, maybe leaving, like she did leave and maybe it wasn't such a good idea. But she still right now does not see the, the church as a cult doesn't see herself as brainwashed, doesn't see herself as a victim. She believes she was led to do this, you know, for her purpose. So I like to say, you know, there's part of her, she's physically out, but there's still some part of her that hasn't, in my perspective, and maybe this is just a way to keep myself safer, right? Hasn't unwrapped her brain totally because if you watch any of the documentaries now on cults, right? It's one thing to leave as someone raised in it. Those people who chose it then have to go, oh my God, why did I choose to do this? Oh my God, why did I leave my children, abandon them when they were 10, 11 and 12? You know, why did I let all these things happen to them? I made that choice. So she hasn't done that. Right. She ever will. Well, um, all I can say is having known a lot of women like your mom when I was a kid, I looked up to these hippie girls, and mm -hmm. uh, but I know a lot of them were, they made bad choices, and those cho bad choices compounded themselves. So uh, I, I look at your mom as almost a sympathetic figure with forgiveness, and I don't even know the whole story. But knowing how, let's face it, uh, in, in political terms, women were still, this is kind of before uh, women's rights movements and all that stuff, or just on the cusp of it. So uh, they were still kind of, they still almost took the identity or 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 drew their sense of self from the man they, they were with and so the hippie girls were kind of lost in this trying to figure out all that stuff and still kind of in that half half in both of those worlds and again bad choices compound themselves i'm not uh saying you're or trying to let your mom off the hook for anything that happened to you but i can look at it and say I could see how that could happen. And, you know, I could Absolutely. see. Absolutely. Me too. And I, I could see now how young girls could end up following a guy like Charles Manson or, or whatever. They just, um, they make bad choices and then that cognitive dissonance takes over. And right. When the bad choice and like, and your brain goes, oh, if I made that choice, it must be right. So this one's right. So this one's right. And he said it was right. And you, it's, it is a rabbit hole and you are down it. Absolutely down it. And that, and our brains, right? My favorite bias we have is the bias where I know I'm not biased. I'm really objective. It's the rest of you that are biased. Right. Yeah. So not only is my brain causing me only to see confirmation bias, what I believe, cognitive dissonance, keeping me from seeing anything that makes me think I'm wrong. And then I know that I'm objective and intelligent. Right. It's like virtually impossible. It's amazing that anyone gets out of that at all. Absolutely. That is the biggest question people who are so far removed from ever having any connection to a cult or a cult-like organization is that 
they can't imagine how smart people, people who are intelligent, and they, they have to be dumb, right? They have to be dumb, but you don't have to be dumb. You could be a genius and still be susceptible to it, Absolutely. correct? Absolutely, and there are geniuses. Yeah, I just, you know, need to say I'm working my way through the documentaries. And there's one, this one cult expert said, I've worked with doctors, I've worked with lawyers, like I've worked with the people we respect, I, you know, in fact, the intelligent people have the brain often to to dig into the answers and find answers. We we all crave it. I, I like wrong time, wrong place, wrong, meet the wrong person, open for whatever reason. And and there are specific ways that they help you start believing more and more and more. The whole foot in the door technique, right? If I right. believe this, then I'll believe that. Then I'll believe that. Then I will get married to someone I've never met before in Madison Square Garden. Right. So um, would you describe your, have you found the, the Leave it to Beaver existence or, or somewhat of the picket fence idea in, in your life uh, after you moved on from there? Well, the reality is if I look out my window, there is a white picket fence in front of the house. <laughs> but I don't belong here. I know I no longer want to Leave it to Beaver. Um, so yes, I have a, you know, a wonderful life. I've been married a long time, 27 years. I have <laughs> grown. My little kids are about that big. Um, I have a career as an executive coach and leadership consultant. I love what I do. I'm still trying to save the world, I jokingly say. I am happy. I'm healthy. I'm whole. There are scars. You know, I, you know, I can tell you maybe you know, very recently I might have been sobbing from some of this stuff as I kind of regurgitate more stuff that's in me. But yeah, my life is amazing, but I, I no longer want the leave it to beaver thing. I actually um, I feel like I went from more alternative to the church, made me more, try to be more normal. Then I went more alternative and then I tried to be more normal. And I'm like, yeah, now I like kind of over here. Yeah. That said, right, without dysfunction, without you know, drugs and abandonment and extreme beliefs and you know, the good thing about my parents, I like to say, is the bar is so low. I'm a much better parent than my parents were, but <laughs> I, 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 I love that because uh, I just yesterday we had a show on parenting and I thought, well, everybody feels at, at some point, everybody feels like it's a, it's a job nobody knows how to do correctly. And all you can do is hope for the best. But a lot of people feel like bad parents and, and, or, or, you know, there's so much I could have done better. But when you have the perspective that you have, and I, I, I can think of my, my own perspective because my both my parents were they not <laughs> like yours. But, in, yeah. in a different way. you know, my father was a compulsive gambler and in and, and organized crime. And my mom was in denial about it and and and, and dismissive. Mm -hmm. And, and kind of not there, even though my mom was a very intelligent person. I mean, they lost me at a racetrack when I was three years old. So, uh, for, for and lost, lost me for four days. So, uh, <laughs> so I mean, you know, how can a mother do that? But it's, again, everybody's messed up. But now, with that perspective that you just gave me, I could say, you know what? Maybe I wasn't such a bad parent. <laughs> You know, yeah. Um, I mean, I do also think I'm a good parent, but and this is how I know the two ways. So I used to always say the disease stops here. That's something you say when you first fall into twelve step program. And my older child will say, "Yes, the disease stops here." So my kids have generational trauma. They definitely have scars from my scars. It is what it is. But you know, when you when the shit has happened to you, you either give it to them or you work so hard not to give it to them that you give them something else. Um, but my older kid is like, you have made it good. And my younger child, this is how I know I've done all right. He hates when I talk about him. Luckily, he doesn't watch these. And he's at college now, but he was home last year, year before. And I came downstairs and I said, I talked about you today. I was interviewed. And he said, well, what did you say? And I said, well, I said that um, I healed through raising my children because I do know that I healed myself by loving my children in the way that I was able to. And I said, and, and when I had kids, the only thing that mattered to me was that my kids knew that they were loved and cherished because whatever, I didn't. And my kid looks at me and he goes, well, I don't know you love me. I mean, my dad loves me and I know Mimi loves me and Papa loves me. Those are my parents. He's like, I know they love me, but I don't know you love me. Wow. Which <laughs> let me know that he so knows I love him and knowing <laughs> so he's so comfortable that that's what he can say. Right. Wow. He knows that I, I I annoy him with how much I dorm. They're both coming home on Saturday. They're driving from the Midwest. And I'm like, I'm going to be all over you guys. Like my, my older child says, I pet. I pet my kids when they come home. <laughs> like, touch, 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 touch. So, so did you, um, were you 
open to having your parents uh, in your children's lives because you, it probably had to be a little nervous about. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, we did. Um, both of them, it was kind of like with a, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I get it. <laughs> I'll leave them alone with my dad because you, you, even if he might not do something really wrong, his still alcoholic, drug addicted friends might. Or with my mom, it was like, but again, she was out of the church at that time, so it was it was have her around and and uh, but you know never actually tell the story. When, when my older, when my younger child actually finally heard the story, amongst other things, he uh, he went and spent the weekend with my mom afterwards, and he came back and he's like, "I don't know how to be with Mimi. Like, I don't know what to do." And I'm like, "Here's the deal: I'm not a good mom, I'm really good grandparent. Right? Yeah. Right? You just have a relationship." So I was able. They both. You know, and they both showed up better for my children and for me through my children than than they did with me. Danny, when um, when my youngest kid was born, he was four weeks early and he could not be put down. And Danny, who hated to work, never like worked as little as he could in his whole life, opened had opened a restaurant in 1985 in New York City and worked seven days a week. Maybe six, but like he just worked nonstop. And then when Max, when my younger child was born, he literally, Danny would take every day off. He would take the train up to Connecticut where I lived and sit with Max so that I could go to sleep. Mm. Nobody else did that, right? And so, yeah, he's a not nice word that begins with A. And yeah, every bad, you know, influence my kids have is probably from him. And yeah, his rage is huge and all of that. And he took his only day off and came and took care of my kid so that to take care of me. Right. Well, it's it's a miracle that they're both still alive. First, it is. <laughs> I mean, because I know so many people uh, my age, and I'm probably about ten years younger than them. Uh, so many people my age are gone, and uh, I grew up in the time that you're talking about, and spent the you know I think I caught every Jefferson Airplane concert in Central Park as well. Uh, so for me. I can relate to the story of your time, but when you share your story with somebody, say, 35 years old, 30 years old, do they, do they have any clue about what, what the hell you're talking about? <laughs> First of all, they're like, what is Mooney? Like, what's a cult? <laughs> right. um, so you kind of have to step back and explain that. And, and by the way, one of the reasons I do this is because there are tons of them out there now. Right. I know that belief is all over the place, right? In a lot of scary ways. Um, but yeah, so they have no, yeah, like they, they always get like, you seem so normal and I don't understand this. Yeah. And you kind of have to stop, pull back and say, this is what the seventies was like. This is what cults were like. As you said, this is the, the Beatles of the Messiahs. My, my Messiah was the biggest, best one. No, not the ones in orange robes, the other biggest, best one. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, and not that I never lived in New York City and never really had a big, uh, never had any desire to be in the city except for concerts and stuff. I'm a suburban guy, but I can still kind of almost relate to your father's life. And to me, you know, when I think back on him, I'm still nostalgic about the, the 70s and how uh, that whole hippie movement in a lot of ways. So I think there's still a lot of that. You said your mom left the church but i also get the impression that the church is still it never left her in a lot of ways it's still in our heart or in the back of her mind even today in, in 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 from my perspective yes and i will also tell you so when the book came out just about everyone in the book i've reconnected with or refound or whatever and all the conversations i have almost everyone says and then there's this moment where you think what if it was right <laughs> Like, what if, what if he was, what if he was the Messiah? What if I die and I find out I really blew it, right? And so it, that's, and that's like, one of my messages is also self, like self-compassion, right? Because of course, that's what my brain does. And I'm pretty certain he's not. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and, it, and if my brain is going to get afraid of that every now and then, like I am, in the book, as you see, I go full circle and I go to hear his daughter, Rev, uh, Injun, whom I was best friends with, go hear her speak at a church sermon. And I walk into that thinking, what if I have to go back? I, that's literally what I thought. What if 20 something years later and kids later and all this life later, I hear her and I go, oh, I was wrong. And I have to go back and, you know, confess and suffer for having sinned so badly by leaving. 
So it 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 doesn't it doesn't go away. It just that's a pretty away. scary thought. Uh, when I think about that, I mean the fact that we can be, even though we we've we think we've moved on, there's still that, I, and I think that's basically uh, when we see people who, <laughs> and I, I don't mean to offend anybody, but anybody who's part of a regular what traditional religion but that is not a church goer or a temple goer or whatever your religion goes to uh when i think the thing that holds them back or keeps them even on the fringe of the religion is fear that what if i'm wrong what if what if i'm wrong so what if there is a heaven and hell and, and that uh, idea that just little twinge of fear yeah. is what keeps them on the fringe of the religion. So I'll call myself a Christian, but never going to church, never reading the Bible. But just in case, I'm going to still call myself a Christian. You know, I think it's Stephen Wright who has a joke. War over religion is like arguing over who has the best imaginary friend. <laughs> because we don't know, right? I know there are people who do believe they know, but honestly, we don't really know, right? Because, because. Yeah, so yes. Yes, and and I will tell you, it is so deeply engraved here. And I go, I go pretty quote unquote naked with a lot of things because I always think there's one other person who's going to hear my story and go, "Oh yeah, me too. I'm not alone." But so my freshman year, when I'm literally pulling away from the church, I am on a bridge at Cornell. I do almost jump. Obviously, I don't. Um, decades, decades later, like that's 1981, right? And in this past summer, I was doing some intense trauma therapy, which I've done, right? And there was a part of me that still thought I should have jumped. I should have died. I left the Messiah and therefore I should have died. I should have killed myself. Wow. Now, my rational part doesn't believe that, but 40 whatever years, like whatever years later, there is this kernel in me that feels that shame and guilt for not killing themselves. Whoa, right? And so... And of course, it's that deeply ingrained in me. And now it's less so because I kind of threw it up a little bit. But, it, it, you know, our brains, I was pickled in it. And our brains believe things. And I, I, I use this in my coaching work, right? All of us, things happen to us. And we misinterpret them, especially when we're little. And we make up lies, false truths. We make up explanations and things, behaviors we need to do, right, in order to keep ourselves safe. And some, like you, probably saved your life, right? Some people, they think it saved their life, whatever. And then you keep doing them as adults. You keep thinking, I'm, it's danger, it's danger, it's danger. I have to be hypervigilant. I have to do this. I have to please everybody. I can't have any needs and wants. It's like, I don't know that it, I won't say that it's sinful, but my being believes it. And that stuff still drives us. Yeah. Right. And uh, we're able to look at it and be like, oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Right. So <laughs> I haven't revealed too much, but I, I reveal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just so, um, um, it, in a way, it's frightening because it could be any one of us. But mm -hmm. it, it, the truth is, uh, you, your story is so unique from anybody else's that most people would think it can't, that could never happen to me. That could never. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, and you mentioned that there are so many of them today, and I agree. I, I, I there are lots of them, and I, I do think organized religions on all. Uh, I think almost all organized, every organized religion at some point is cultish. Now, whether I'm not diminishing anyone's beliefs, I'm talking about the organization mm -hmm. of like right from the Roman Catholic Church straight on down is cultish. Uh, but there's a, a lot of them out there. Or do you? kind of are you studying them or is that part of um do, do you feel compelled to keep keep up on what, what you know when i when i first left i just pretended it didn't happen and actually when i when i really fell apart and hit bottom and started you know went into al-anon and started looking at this uh i was in group group therapy and the therapist said to me you know you have to integrate the church in order to heal and i believe i cursed it i'm like no blank away am i ever doing that <laughs> Um, but, but for it's, me, to, to your point, though, that's almost like offering a, a, a drug addict a pain pill, you yeah. know, and they have yeah. to say, "No, I, yeah, I'm yeah. addictive." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? And so, and so, I. But for me, I did have to slowly start to integrate, right, in order to do that. And then, but when I left, I like I was alone. There was nothing. And then, when because of the book, just before the book came out, I found the Cult Survivor Network. And 
it was like, you know, I remember when I stumbled by mistake into an adult children of alcoholics meeting and they read the, read the laundry list of children of alcoholics and you're like, yes, yes, doesn't everybody? Of course, yes, not so much. No, yes, 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 yes. Like, oh, I had no idea. When I was, I went to a conference for cold survivors and I'm in a room of second, children, those of us born and or raised, and someone puts on the, on, you know, up on a PowerPoint what it does to your brain. And I look at that and I go, oh, that's my brain. Like that's literally my brain. That's every fight I've had in my marriage and that's my brain. So it, it was like this, oh, I get it. And I can meet a second gen. I now, I used to travel when we could travel, travel to speak about it. And I'm in Scotland with, you know, someone who's Scottish who was raised in the Jehovah's Witnesses. And other people will say things and I'll look at him and we have the exact same thoughts. I feel like I know his insides better than I know some of my best friends. Like we're carved very identically. So that has been an amazing experience to find that community. And then because I've been out so long and I am so healthy and I've worked so hard and I am so, I have so much joy and love in me, right? I feel compelled, again, that's why I'm telling my story, right? Compelled to help other people. So I am very involved. You know, I am watching the documentaries. I am getting involved in a not-for-profit to help people stay out and get out. I am speaking whenever possible. I am putting it out there because they exist. We're all susceptible. And even if it's not about cults, right? For anyone who feels hopeless or damaged beyond repair, you're not damaged and there is hope, right? I've been there and I just want to spread that message. So, so yes, I yeah. spent a lot of time on it now. <laughs> you know, we talk about mental health a lot on this program and I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a big believer that mental, uh, the, the place called mentally healthy does not exist. All we can do is get be more, more mentally healthy, but we can never reach that place called uh, mentally healthy. And everybody, everybody has this, the scars and all that kind of stuff. And I think what the problem is, we kind of look at other people and, and get misled in like, and you can have even you can think somebody else is even the Messiah. That's how strong we can look at other people and think they've got it all together. So whenever we look at other people outward and we think they've got it all together, now this is just my my opinion and nothing more than that. They they're forty nine percent mentally healthy, and that's the most a human being can can achieve. Uh, so one in Al Anon, there is a saying: "Don't compare your insides to someone else's outsides." Right. Even at my most broken, I looked so functional on the outside. I truly did, right? And you never know how much people are walking around with. And someone just sent me a quote, you know, that I will post soon. I think it's from John Rivers. It says something like, they say it gets better. It doesn't get better. You get better. Oh, I like that. Right? Right? <laughs> right? And, I, like, and it's like I talk to my clients about balance. What's balance? If they ever watch a tightrope walker, they're going like this the whole time, Right? Um, and that to me is healthy. It's like, all right, compassion, because I was just today, you know, I have a sister-in-law who was literally raised in the Soviet bloc and she reacts to stuff. And I said, of course she reacts that way. And then I react to stuff and I think, why am I still reacting that way? You know, right? yeah. it's always a process. There's always, I am, I have so much joy and there's so much pain that can still come up. And sometimes I feel really healthy and sometimes I'm really not and I'm stuck in it. And it's, how do you hold that? How do you hold all of that? Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm struggling with whether to a ask you this question. Okay, question. I, Go ahead. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to put you in an uncomfortable position, but, uh, and, and, or, you know, make, put you in the lines of any kind of um, hate mail that I might get. But I have to ask because it, it compels me to think that I am right about this. When you look at what's going on in America today from the political landscape, do you see any uh, correspondence to cult-like behavior? <laughs> None whatsoever. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, so to go to organized religion, right? There's organized religion and then anything can be taken too far, right? Extremism is extremism is extremism. When I talk about extremist groups, I'm talking about cults, religious cults. I'm talking about political cults. I'm talking about terrorist groups. I'm talking about white supremacist gangs. I'm talking about the KK, like all of that. And so, okay, is Trump, are Trump followers in a cult? No. Is there cult-like characteristics from my perspective? Yes. Careful. QAnon? Yes. Anything that controls what you believe that strongly 
anything that's this is all right and that's all wrong, right? That and it doesn't let you have any other perspectives and controls what you do and how you show up. Yes, right. Yeah. There's there's like cultic relationships, there's cultic behavior, and there's cultic beliefs. And when you get all of them together at that intersection, it's a cult. But at literally, you know, people say to me, "Why do people believe him?" And I'm like, "Let's talk about cognitive dissonance. Let's talk about when you've already invested everything in someone." To believe in them, you will do anything to keep believing in them. There's a lot of extremist thought, controlling thought going on now. Yes. So, uh, yeah, and I appreciate your, all your the hate mail. No, no, I'll take all the hate mail. But I appreciate your your the way you answered that and very, very uh, eloquently. Uh, I do think QAnon is absolutely a cult. I, I actually had one person from Q on this program by accident. He was on as a musician, and, and it, I kind of discovered it accidentally but then when we were off the air afterwards he started telling me about seeing jfk jr and all. um but so on that perspective though because this is what baffles me about that perspective is had you ever seen moon in your time there just say things that were absolutely proven to be false you knew they were false when he was saying them or, or it was proven but you part of you had forced yourself to deny it that that that's the truth even though he, you know because uh, i'm thinking as in tr the trump stuff is blatant lie after blatant lie that can be demonstrably proven to be false but we will still believe him did moon ever do that and you you said no nah, it's a fake news <laughs> i mean it was different but so one jesus appeared to me when I was 15 and told me I had to take on his path. Jesus failed. Two, Nixon is innocent, <laughs> right? We supported Nixon, right? Um, so, and it's actually probably hard for me to do because I believe, right? I can tell you that, you know, my high school, my senior year of high school, wanting to convert all my friends, I brought them to a lecture and then I sat in horror in the back of the room as my really intelligent friends debated everything, right? So so clearly there were, I've been told there are parts of the divine principle, the teachings of the church that are literally not what's in the Bible. But to this day, right, my brain still, and when I read it, it believes it. So, so it wasn't like the New York Times was saying, you know, okay, let's go with this one. He says he won the election. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. or or you know corona is a hoax or a plot from the democratic party like it wasn't like there were those sorts of things i suppose but yes i'm certain there were things that i absolutely believed to be true which the rest of you would be like you're insane that's completely not true so that right. is what extremist belief does you, you give up everything so that you can believe that fervently because again it is an amazing feeling it's an right. amazing feeling. So, uh, and not, a, this is not about Trump, but all about the entire, taking, when we take all that into perspective, that cult, the idea that people can be uh, manipulated into more cults, and there are more cults are being born constantly. Are you an optimist for the, not America, for the state of the world and so, or, or humanity that we are just becoming more susceptible to these, you know, optimists that we're not, be, you know, we're not going to be part. This isn't going to be normal for, for forever, that there is some kind of escaping cult mentality or breaking free from any of what we what you call cognitive dissonance. I, I, I have to be an optimist. That's how I that's how I live my life. Right. If, if people say, what, what do you believe now? I say, my God is love. God X, God S. My God's pronouns are they. It's love, right? It's love, and and I do believe in a in a energy of love in the world, right? And it's maybe not true, but it makes me feel good, and I don't believe it extremely. Um, so, yeah, like, especially now when I look at everything that's happening, part of me goes, <laughs> "Only one way we can go," and the other part, because I do need to believe in hope, right, and joy and love. That's how I have to choose to live my life. Um, says. Things are really broken and maybe maybe every way we're breaking now will finally crack it open so we can, the goodness can come out. I, I mean, I think that people always be susceptible. I think there'll always be things, but maybe more and more people will be woke, right? To, to a connection and to a belief and to healing from many of the evils of our 
current society. Right. I'm Pollyanna, right? But sometimes that's the only way I keep going is I got to believe. I got a kid who's a social activist. I'm going to have a kid who's probably an environmental activist. The kids these days are, many of them are eager and encouraged and ready to do something different. So I have to believe that person kind, humankind will, uh, will manage to find a better way. Well, I appreciate that as well because um, that's really the only way only way you can survive uh, in a, in the world today is is believing that when things get really crazy, it's meant to happen to lead to something better. Uh, when things when things get broken down, when society breaks down, you ho- you're hoping that well, maybe this is an important. Uh, um, catalyst to change to positive change that will will be event because if you don't think that then you're probably going to be suicidal you're probably going to you know not be able to live a very happy life uh i I know we're coming up on the hour this has been a a very uh fascinating and and mind-blowing kind of uh talk um have you heard from a lot of people who your book has changed their lives and and yeah. and, and, uh, uh, and so i say i will well, i'll speak anywhere i'll talk anywhere i'll do book clubs anywhere and reach out to me so i have you know i've heard from people i know i've heard from people i don't know i've been reached out to in every social media i, I get emails uh, i've people in cults people in other organizations people not in organizations and every time i think why am i still doing this right I get another or a couple more from from strangers saying, thank you. Your story gave me hope. Your story, this, you know, I get was talking to some kid somewhere and she was telling the trauma in her life. And I'm like, this is one thing I know. I wouldn't wish trauma on anyone. But those of us who have suffered often have a greater appreciation for life and the simple things in life than people who haven't experienced the negatives and the downs. So like, love yourself, love yourself, love yourself and stay in touch. Right. Yes. So, yes. And that's, that's why I do this. If okay. telling my story helps one person, which I have helped at least more than one person with their own stuff, it's all worth it. Absolutely all worth it. So. Well, uh, they, you know, on that point, David Essel was on the program a couple uh, about two weeks ago now, and his told me uh, his goal was to positively affect two million people every single day. And I was like, wow. <laughs> right, <laughs> man. I got up I, and I'm with, I'm with I you. Yeah, I'm with you. If I can help one person, I feel like I've accomplished. I, I moved a mountain, uh, but yeah, I can't imagine having that goal. But good for him, and I, I hope I hope he's successful in it. Uh, the the URL for your website is Lisa Cohn Writes, and um, uh, there's a whole lot there to be seen. Now, uh, are, are you planning on writing another book, or because it's Lisa Cohn Writes, not wrote? <laughs> not Lisa Cohn Wrote. <laughs> <laughs> <Feels good>. um, <laughs> I like that. Yes, I don't know what it is yet. I know I love to write. I know I have a lot to say. I know I love creative nonfiction and telling a story. And I'm pretty certain I don't want to write about my you know current immediate family. So therefore, I walk this line of you know what's the stories I want to tell and how can I tell it without driving people into it who don't need to be drugged into it. So, but yes, it's uh, and I've just been working so hard to promote this and to keep this going. And there's possibilities of things happening with it. But yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna write again. I'm gonna say that enough, and you've you've convinced me. It's not Lisa Cohn wrote, so I do have to actually keep doing this. Right? Yeah. Uh, well, you talk about documentaries. I don't know if this is a documentary or a, a drama, a docudrama that could be made out of this, but I think it's an important story. Also, uh, I, if you're within the sound of my voice, go to Joe Rogan's website and tell tell him about Lisa and uh, let him know about it because I do think. Your story is an important story in, in the world today with everything that's going on and all the cognitive dissonance that's happening everywhere. Your story is absolutely the most powerful story we've had on this program. I've talked to a lot of interesting people. I can tell you that about 10 minutes into this uh, interview, I started to get a chill and like, I'm in my glory. This is why I started the program to bring people who have stories like uh, you, uh, your story, to bring it to the public awareness and and let people uh, hopefully feel affected in a positive way by other people's stories. And, uh, you know, so this is why I got into podcasting, why I got into radio many years ago. It's just my favorite 
uh, experience behind a microphone is, has been this last hour, and I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, the link to your website and the book will be in the description. Um, please come on back anytime you want to further, you know, talk about this stuff, and especially if you if you do put out another book to promote it. Uh, but I just thank you for for your time and and thank you, thank you, Matt. Thank you. It's been a delight. Yeah, uh, so I'm not going to forget this for a long time, and I'll be I'll be talking about it a lot. So thank thank you, and have a great day. And bye for now. Bye, Lisa Cohn, folks. Lisa Cohn writes. Uh, I don't even know where to begin to sum up all the takeaways from that, but the the truth is, you know, the world is becoming more and more full of uh, cognitive dissonance, and this idea that I'm only going to believe what I believe, and uh, scared to have an open mind. And if you look at the mission statement of this program, it's about encouraging free, independent thought, and encouraging people to think for themselves. And I always tell people, you know, when you find that, please, if you agree with this cut and paste, uh, don't do that. Don't do that. If even if you think yes, I'm, you're inclined to do that, read it and then see. Put it into your own words and make sure it aligns with your own core beliefs and principles. If you can't do that, then you're you're buying into this cognitive dissonance idea. This I'm going to let somebody else think for me, and I think that's the most dangerous thing facing the world today. A number one issue that we have with humanity. Hope you enjoyed this program. I hope you got something out of it, and we'll come on back. Subscribe. Tell your friends about it. And as I mentioned. Let Joe Rogan know. Go to JoeRogan.com, and there's a contact sheet in there. And on, on the left side, it says propose uh, a, a guest for the program. Uh, tell them about Lisa and, and put in Lisa Cohn writes it for them to check out. Uh, LisaCohnWrites.com for them to check out the website because uh, her story needs to have a much bigger platform than, than I can provide for her here. I uh, hope you enjoyed this program. hope you come back. Tell your friends about it. Subscribe. Go to my YouTube channel. Subscribe there. Go to MindDogTV.com and get on my mailing list and questions and comments for me and hate mail, of course. <laughs> uh, info at MindDogTV.com. I'm look, just looking for who we have on tonight. Uh, I'm not even prepared for tonight's uh, program now. Um, who do we have on tonight? Where are we here? Oh, Spike Spencer, another uh, edition of Meet the Author. So that's at 8 p.m. Eastern. I hope you'll join me then. Till then, I'm Matt Napa for the Mind Dog TV podcast. Have a great rest of your day and bye for now. <laughs>